Everybody, Luke Groman, founder and president of FFTT Forest for the Trees. Hope everyone has had a great weekend. Um, wanted to uh, check in on our Sunday night periscope here again. The new format, two uh, things that grabbed my attention recently uh, in about 90 seconds or so. So the first up is um, uh, the uh, rules-based global order, a phrase uh, termed by Raoul Paul, which I think is a very uh, apropos phrase. Uh, he noted it's breaking down, or appears to be breaking down. Uh, he and I tweeted about it a bit today, and I uh, totally agree. And, and uh, I think it's a very important thing to note, because if it is, it has very far-ranging implications. Um, uh, you're starting to talk, if, if, if you're talking about the rules-based global order breaking down vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis what's happening with Saudi, Russia, EU, China, U.S., uh, then all of a sudden you're talking about a much more multilateral world. Huge implications, huge. And, and the biggest of that is that if you have a multilateral world rather than a dollar-centric world, the world, uh, the global currency system is going to begin trading uh, on a uh, balance of a global currency is going to be trading on a balance of payments basis for the first time in 50 to 70 years. And uh, if that's the case... Um, you know, then you know, on a balance of payments basis, uh, the U.S. dollar is not the cleanest dirty shirt; it's the dirtiest dirty shirt. Um, uh, uh, for the first time in 50 to 70 years, deficits begin to matter again, um, and so uh, you know, for the first time in 50 to 70 years, uh, other central banks don't need to stockpile treasury bonds ad infinitum uh, at uh, potentially uneconomic uh, levels. So, um, very uh, important uh, dynamic, um, and you know, uh, very few people looking at. I think it's important to pay attention to. Second thing is that housing is more notably beginning to break down um, as a result of uh, rising interest rates. Um, you've all, also stronger dollar, of course. Uh, you have seen um, uh, the housing data soften ex uh, existing home sales the latest uh, late last week. Something that grabbed my attention within that is uh, Goldman had a call out that they still expect another five rate hikes uh, between now and the end of next year. And it just it just grabbed me that, you know, it seems very possible to me that this five more rate hikes, given what we're seeing in housing and elsewhere, uh, could be the equivalent, or made me wonder, shall we say, could it be the equivalent of Goldman's $200 oil call back in summer of 08 when oil was already almost $150 a barrel? Um, it just, um, boy, five rate hikes, I'd, I'd be pretty surprised. I think uh, um, uh, it seems unlikely to me. So I'm going to open it up here for questions in a second. Um, really quickly, just wanted to highlight uh, on our webs, tomorrow we are going to be uh, uh, opening up, uh, Sunday, excuse me, tomorrow we are going to be sending out the sign-up link to a, uh, um, a paid two-hour-long webinar uh, slide deck that will be sent to everybody, uh, Q&A the whole time, as long as we can stay on for, for two hours or more. Uh, it'll be limited and on a, uh, a limited number of seats on a paid basis, and it will be going out first come, first serve basis to everyone on our mailing list. And so if you're uh, potentially interested, hop on our uh, website, fftt-llc.com, uh, sign up and get on our mailing list, and that uh, invitation uh, will be going out uh, tomorrow, uh, at some point tomorrow. So with that, I will uh, open it up for questions and see what, uh, um, you know, see what uh, people are thinking about out there. Let's see. So far, no questions. A couple late joiners here. There we go. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. Um, was the bombing of Iraq, Libya, Syria, rules-based global order? I'd call it a global order, just not rules-based. Um, it's good to be king, I suppose. Uh, he was he was king makes the rules. I, I think it's a very valid point. All all joking or tongue in cheek tongue in cheek uh, responses aside, um, and I think ultimately you raise a very good point by highlighting those things, which is that the rules based global order based around the dollar is ultimately. 
um, you know, Triffin's dilemma where you have one national currency be the reserve currency, uh, we've known about this for 60 years. It was highlighted almost 60 years ago. Um, we've sort of, you know, the system broke down in the uh, early 70s, kind of got patched uh, together. Volcker, um, you know, raised rates to def effectively defend the dollar and stamp out a, an incipient hyperinflation in the United States. Um, in the early 80s, that set us up for the next 20 to 25, almost 30 years. Um, but ultimately, we've sort of run out of runway once you get rates to zero, some of the financialization. Um, the gist of it is, is the bottom line is some of the things that have needed to be done geopolitically in order to maintain the dollar-centric rules-based global order have sown the seeds for its own, um, ultimately, its own demise. And so, you know, your point is very well taken that... Uh, um, you know, when you talk about a rules-based global order going away, uh, look, I think if you're a citizen in Iraq or you're a citizen in Syria, um, it's probably, um, you know, there's, there, there, there's probably some facets of that that have been um, quite distasteful. Uh, let's see, Russia and China are key to establishing a rules-based global order. They deter the U.S. Look, I think um, when you... When you look at what has transpired, when the USSR collapsed in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down, there was a very unique moment in history. It was a very unique opportunity um, to really establish, um, for lack of a, well, I think it's been called a peace dividend. Uh, the United States could have pulled back, uh, defunded the military, uh, instead in increased funding for uh, infrastructure, technology, education, um, done a lot of interesting things, and, and you know, we did maybe a little bit, but not uh, nearly enough. And instead, you know, it's interesting, um, you can read, I've read in the past, um, uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, who was, uh, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was uh, uh, um, uh, Colin Powell, Secretary of State Colin Powell's chief of staff, said part of the deal uh, for basically 1989 USSR collapsing without a shot being fired uh, was we promised, we, the United States, promised uh, the Soviets uh, that we would not go one inch east. NATO would not go one, or, uh, yes, NATO would not go one inch east. And, of course, under Bill Clinton, we went hundreds of miles east uh, with, you know, missiles the whole way. And so, to the extent you're talking about a balancing and a multi, more multilateral system, uh, you're talking about more competition, both military competition, unfortunately, uh, and also economic competition. And that then gets back to my point of, um, if you have a more multilateral system, um, you know, the Chinese are not going to be very incented to buy a whole bunch of treasury bonds to fund uh, the United States Defense Department that has missiles pointed at them. And that's, you know, this is something uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff Admiral Michael Mullen said back in 2011, we're borrowing money from China to build weapons to face down China. This is not a sustainable strategy. So the DOD guys have been on this for some time, but it points back to that initial point of the thing that really grabbed my attention about this rules-based global order, which is that if you're going to a multilateral system and you actually have to compete on fundamentals, again, on fundamentals of currencies, fundamentals of economies, uh, just by virtue of the way this system has evolved uh, since 1971, uh, and then again after 1989, 1992, with, uh, 94 with NAFTA and, and WTO after 01, um, U.S. has left itself with not a great hand. Um, and, you know, they've left themselves with, with one really strong card to play, which is the dollar and the weaponization of the dollar. Uh, but like anything, if you use that weapon over and over and over, which we have done uh, in particular since 2012, uh, at some point people begin to find workarounds because it is such a serious threat. So, yeah, I, I do think that there is an element of balancing there. I ultimately think this has an opportunity to be very, very bullish for the world very bullish for the United States uh, in terms of the amount of uh, reinvestment that needs to happen in infrastructure, industrial capacity. Uh, we can compete well with anybody with a properly valued currency, but um, ultimately, um, you know, there's also, uh, you know, this can also go really, really badly. And, you know, when you look into uh, Graham Allison's Thucydides trap, some of the work around that, um, he definitely goes into that in far, far greater detail. Uh, let's see. Thoughts on SoftBank, Vision Fund, and unicorns in Silicon Valley. Epsilon Theory had a nice article. Hi, Andrew. Um, you know, I didn't read the article. Um, you know, it's been interesting. The only thing I've seen on Silicon Valley this week has, has been, as it's, you know, that has caught my attention has been as it's, as it's related to uh, Saudi Arabia and the amount of uh, VC funding, etc., coming from Saudi Arabia. And so, I, you know, people want to moralize it. Um, 
look, it, 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 it is what it is. The thing that grabbed me about it is a lot of the tech types are very, tech people, tech types are very quick to say, well, commodities are becoming increasingly irrelevant. Oil's irrelevant. Your lens of the world's irrelevant. And then you see this article where a very large amount of VC funding in Silicon Valley is coming from the Saudis. And you kind of go, well, if the Saudis stop funding you know, VC in, in Silicon Valley all of a sudden, A, you know, oil's still very relevant. B, um, it's a very big stick. I mean, it's, it's going to be really interesting to watch and see how this plays out. I'll take a look at that article, so if, uh, see, what, uh, see what it says. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, ES get risk of falling apart here. So the S&P 500 uh, from, from Jay West, uh, how you doing? Um, is the S&P at risk of falling apart here? I think there's something very important happening in markets that virtually nobody's talking about. Um, it's a bit wonkish, but um, effectively, there was an article we put on our Twitter feed. I'd uh, encourage you to go track it down. There was a Bloomberg article last week noting that for foreign investors, the, um, the yield on U.S. Treasury bonds hedged for FX movements. So basically... If you're a big Japanese pension fund or insurance company or German, um, when you buy treasury bonds, uh, you buy them and you immediately heal, uh, heal. You immediately hedge the currency risk. And so the yield on American treasury bonds is way higher than other sovereign debt like you know, German Boons and, and, and uh, JGBs. Uh, and so it seems like it's a no-brainer that they will just keep rolling U.S. debt. Um, the challenge is that as a result of balance sheet, apparent balance sheet restrictions um, on American banks, the price to hedge the currency risk is now so expensive that it is now more attractive for these companies, these foreigners, to buy their own bonds or, you know, the Japanese buy German bonds and vice versa, as opposed to treasury bonds. It's an enormous, enormous deal, and I think that's what the market is starting to sniff out because there's only two ways that you can sort of fix that. Well, three ways. There's only three ways you can fix this, this hedging problem. One, the, the balance sheet problems for the banks, the balance sheet restrictions that are forcing them to increase pricing or start cutting back on these FX swaps. You have to increase those balance sheets, and I, I don't know uh, what's driving that or if they're about to do that or if the regulators or why the regulators have tapped them on the shoulder. The second option is rates have to go a lot higher fast. Um, you, know, you take you know three two to three five on the ten year quickly. Um, it's probably not positive for risk assets. Certainly not positive for housing uh, and some of the more interest rate sensitive uh, assets. Not just in the U.S. but globally. Uh, or the dollar's got to get weakened pretty notably. Uh, and so I think if the dollar weakens notably, it could be positive. But ultimately, um, and I ultimately think that's how this will be resolved. But this sort of very wonky. Um, uh, Bloomberg article is definitely worth taking a look at. I think it's a very important thing to understand because most people are looking at the yield differentials and just saying, oh, but people are going to keep buying treasuries. But if you don't look at that FX hedging, um, you're missing the full picture. And that's exactly the point the Bloomberg article made. Uh, let's see. I mentioned that Saudi's about to accept yuan for oil. Could I please elaborate on the dollar? Thanks. Uh, the uh, article he's referring to, or he or she's referring to, can't tell from the Twitter handle. Sorry about that. Um, the, the article they're referring to is um, uh, on my Twitter feed, and it is from the Foreign Policy Journal, uh, which is an interesting place, in my opinion, for such an article to um, uh, be posted, simply because this is a, um, it's very much an establishment magazine, right? Foreign Policy Journal's uh, Council on Foreign Relations uh, uh, magazine. And so... Um, the article notes that the China has a problem because they've got to buy all their commodities in dollars and they're trying to de-dollarize by moving uh, some of their commodity purchases to uh, be priced in yuan. Uh, and the article says, um, you know, all that sounds very familiar to people that have been, you know, listening to FFTT for a while. But the article says that China is close or Saudi is close to pricing oil in yuan. And to me, I read that and my jaw dropped. Not so much that I'm surprised that it's happening because when you look at the leverage and who has the leverage in the dynamics, it seems clear to me it's going to have to happen. Uh, but we've also been hearing it a number of different times uh, from uh, you know, pretty well-placed sources um, that it'll eventually have to happen. Uh, you've seen some hints at it over the last year in other mainstream media articles. Uh, but uh, ultimately, if it happens, 
um, you know, I think it ties back to this initial point of the rules-based global order breaking down. And when we say the rules-based global order, you know, you had to have dollars to buy commodities and everyone stockpiled dollars because you had to have dollars to stockpile commodities. And so trade was all done in dollars by and large. And once you unravel, there's a very big network effect. There's a lot of leverage in the system. Once it starts to unravel and snowball the other way, it turns into a vicious cycle where if China can print you want for oil, they don't need treasuries. If Europe can print euro for Iranian oil, they don't need treasuries. Um, and if, uh, if, if you don't need treasuries, then the U.S. government either needs to uh, cut back on its spending or the Fed needs to fund the U.S. government spending or the U.S. Uh, citizenry needs to fund their own spending. And the challenge, of course, to the U.S. funding its own spending is that um, it's an enormous number. It would consume an enormous percentage of, con of consumer discretionary spending. And that's a problem for an economy that's two-thirds consumer. So um, it basically, um, you know, it would be a big brick in the wall of defunding the U.S. government and putting pressure on the U.S. fiscal situation. Um, and so you'd be talking about, ironically, well, you'd be talking about rates higher. Um, you know, you'd ironically have an impetus for dollar higher. Um, but I'm not so sure that that would be the case here. Um, mechanically, it would be dollar higher. I think at some point there are news stories where the writing gets put on the wall and people suddenly say, oh my gosh, that's, you know, mechanically I understand there's a dollar shortage or a dollar squeeze going on, but this is a huge data point and there's a tipping point here. And all of a sudden, you know, it's no longer, oh gosh, I need dollars. It's, oh gosh, I need, you know, to get out of dollars. So uh, the way you get out of dollars is, you know, it's too big to at this point going to physical gold or, you know, treasuries is, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. And I think where you go uh, to get out of dollars is you go into S&P and other risk assets. And I think that's why, as we've been saying, this S&P over TLT, right, the S&P 500 over, t over the long bond uh, is been steadily rising for two years now. We think it's going to continue to rise secularly. I'm not saying it can't pull back, but secularly, that's really a big gauge of what's happening here where there's this realization, I think, Based on a move, if the rules-based global order is breaking down, then you are moving towards a more multilateral system. And in a multilateral system, the U.S. government has a fiscal problem. Let's see here. Um, risk owning a Russian company like YNDX on NASDAQ. I think it's a, the, the risk that, you know, that we've seen for the last four years, right, in terms of some of the sanctions and stuff. I would certainly want to understand uh, all of those dynamics. Missed the start here. Let's see. Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, Italian banks all seem to always be falling apart. Is this time the real deal? Um, maybe. <laughs> the, you know, to me, the question, you know, and there are uh, better sources to talk to to really get into the nitty gritty of the Italian banks and the issue of, you know, using the markets to try to bring the Italian government into line regarding the deficits. You know, it's, it is... You know, two things grab I me. Mean, number one, it's it, it's interesting to me when you look at the you know the quote unquote disastrous Italian deficit numbers and you overlay it relative to what the U.S. is is not that disastrous. No, of course I understand we're dealing with a different animal on a number of different levels, but it does tie back to that point on the rules based global order where if we're going multilateral, sort of everyone's going to start to be judged in the same metrics, and that's why I said the dollar's the dirtiest dirty shirt in that case. But bigger picture, what I really have a hard time sort of getting a feel for is if the Italian banks have a problem, you know, there seems to be this dynamic that people think that we're going to have, you know, months and months and months until it spreads. Um, and it just, to me, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, to me, you know, when I look at things in the sovereign, you know, and it's not, you know, the Western sovereigns in particular, the next crisis, you know, people are going to have a problem. You've had a number of different central banks talking about we're sort of out of ammo, a number of different authorities. And so it really doesn't matter whose crisis it is, what crisis it is, where it is, um, that starts to touch off sort of like, you know, a big problem. And so um, I think, you know, it's sort of a roundabout way of talking about, but hopefully it helps illuminate some of how I'm thinking about it. Hypothetically, if the U.S. had a zero national debt and a balanced budget, should we have a balance of payments problem? Uh, zero national debt and a balanced budget 
it would depend, right, because you have two sides to when we're talking about the deficits, right? So you have the federal deficit where the government is either, you know, borrowing money or not, right? So that would be a balanced budget. National debt is just basically accumulated deficits historically. So let's say those are wiped out to zero. If we have a balanced budget, then the federal government's budget is zero. Yeah, that would, or they, they, the deficit is zero. Now you're talking about the private sector then. So would the private sector then be able to produce everything um, we need domestically as an economy? And that's, so would we have a balance of payments problem? You know, it, it would depend. It would, you know, are we still importing, you know, 9 million barrels a day of oil? If yes, okay, then we're going to be running a big trade deficit. Okay, well, do people like our currency? Well, you know, do they like our currency because it's pegged to gold at 35 an ounce, which is how it used to work? Or do they like our currency because it's the only game in town and, uh, and we protect them from the Soviet Union? Well, the Soviet Union is not, a, not, not an issue anymore. Um, as much as we'd like to, you know, you know, try to convince the Europeans that the Russians are about to invade them, and then in the second breath tell them that the Russians have a demographic problem, and then in the third breath, you know, hear that, you know, they're buying a lot of gas from the Russians, um, you know, at any rate, the, the, the balance of payments problem, it would be very dependent on the trade. You know, you're basically saying, what's the trade balance look like, right? Um, and, uh, and, and what's the currency? So there's no easy way to answer that, but hopefully that frames it up for you. Should I YOLO my account on weekly ES puts? I would not YOLO anything <laughs> in your accounts. Do I think, uh, hi Tyler, uh, Tyler, uh, do I think the global economy would work better on a system, something similar to Keynes's bank core? Yes, I do. I think it would work uh, much better. Uh, I think there would be vicious sector rotations um, that would need to occur, uh, but it would ultimately be much more sustainable and global trade, I think, would boom. And when I say the victor, vic vicious sector rotations would need to occur, uh, in short, uh, Asia and China specifically would have to consume a lot more uh, of their own production, and the U.S. in particular would need to uh, produce a lot more of their own consumption. Um, to my eyes, when you look at the flow of gold, a neutral reserve asset, not dissimilar from Keynes's bank or um, you know, floating in currencies, when you look at what Eurasia has been doing in terms of either stockpiling, buying gold, Russia, China, uh, India, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, etc., or repatriating gold, uh, a number of countries in the EU, including Germany, Netherlands, Austria, uh, etc. Um, it seems potentially that that is something they are moving towards. It was something that was talked about in the 1970s. If you read uh, declassified State Department briefings from the United States, the EU trying to do it back then. Looks like maybe we're moving in that direction, but I do think it was, you would not have these imbalances that built up over time. It would be a much more balanced economy and probably be a bit more peaceful, but who knows. I wonder if Saudi is waiting for the U.S. to break the deal, Trump stopping arms sales. You know, all I'll say about this is the, 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 the amount of uproar over this seems to be disproportionate, and that is certainly odd and has my attention. With gold breaking out, what do you do to set up directly now? I, do you grab some gold now or or not? I, I still think gold, you know, physically held out of the banking system is the credit default swap of this cycle. I think it's going to do very little and then it's going to be repriced at some point in a probably very binary fashion. So... All right, everybody, looks like I'm out of questions. I'm going to uh, get hopping here. Hope everyone uh, has a great week, and uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with you all very soon. Thanks again for uh, signing in, and we'll talk soon, guys. Take care.